of electrical engineering at Duke University, joining the huge efflux of Georgia Tech faculty to that, that part of the world. So we certainly wish you well there. Um, Ken has won a number of awards. Uh, one of the more recent ones is uh, uh, being appointed as a Kavli Fellow in 2013. Um, his research, he, he's one of those rare um, researchers whose who's, uh, work spans both experimental and theoretical work, and I think we'll hear some of that today um, broadly in the areas of ion traps and uh, quantum computing. So I'm going to turn it over to Ken. Thanks, David. Thanks for the, the opportunity to talk and tell you guys a little bit about quantum computing. Um, my main goal uh, with all talks is for, to try to transfer information. <laughs> so if you have questions about anything at any time, stop me. I'm happy to talk about it, talk about it offline. So um, when you think about uh, computational resources spent in the US, uh, a good place where a lot of scientific computation is done is the Department of Energy. This is kind of an old plot from 2011 showing how the computational resources of the Department of Energy are spent. And you'll notice these big Qs, which are calculations that only make sense if you include quantum mechanical terms. And most importantly, these two guys here, materials and chemistry, are really about calculating um, the quantum mechanical wave functions of electrons. That's all that's going on. So what's the problem with electrons? So in 1929, uh, Dirac, noted that we knew everything there is to know about electrons. They're a simple particle. They have a simple spin, charge, easy interaction with Coulomb's law. But he also noted that even though these laws are simple, they lead to equations which are much too complicated to be soluble. And uh, he then goes on to think about ways to do approximations. And in fact, a lot of our technological development as a society has been as computers get larger, our ability to solve complicated chemical and material problems gets better, which allows us to make better computers, which then kind of feeds naturally with itself. But I just want to take a second to talk a little bit about, like, why is this problem hard? So the basic idea of a quantum chemistry problem is you have a bunch of nuclei which are fixed in space. And then you ask, where should I put these electrons? Um, so it doesn't seem too bad. The electrons should, of course, float around the nuclei. And all we have to do is minimize the Schrodinger equation, find the ground state wave function for some given Hamiltonian, which gives us this minimal ground state energy. Now, there are simple rules, really simple rules, right? So electrons move. Electrons repel each other. Electrons are attracted to nuclei. Then there's a kind of a weird rule, which is that electrons have to have different addresses, the Pauli exclusion principle. And so in some sense, the problem is, how do we choose these addresses? Like, what, 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 which electrons go where? And so um, one way to make the problem solvable is to start with addresses we understand. So we kind of know how electrons arrange themselves in atoms. So what we do is we just pick atomic orbitals as possible addresses for the electrons to sit at. And then what we want to do is we want to basically ask the Hamiltonian can really be thought of as an equation which governs how electrons change addresses. So there are two parts. The first part, which contains the kinetic energy and the attraction to nuclei, basically says an electron will change its address from, say, k to j. That's it, kind of just a hopping of the electrons around. Um, the second term, which is about electrons repelling each other, says that two electrons and two addresses, because, it, you know, I don't know. You kind of think of them as bad neighbors, right? <laughs> They're, they live next to each other. They prefer to live further away from each other. <laughs> and so if one of the neighbors tries to move closer, you might indeed move down the next house. Um, so these are these electrons repelling each other. And that's it. That's the whole problem. And that's why Dirac said, basically, the problem is solved. Um, now, what is the solution to the problem is pretty challenging. So there's some good news. And so the good news is 
that the problem size, if you think about it in terms of the number of addresses or spin orbitals, is pretty small. It's just m to the 4 and m squared. The bad news is the possible number of configurations is basically the number of addresses choose the number of electrons, which is exponential <laughs> in the number of addresses, which is usually linearly proportional to the number of electrons. Um, and so this is a huge configuration space. And this is where the quantum mechanics um, rears its ugly head and says that the ground state is actually some superposition over, over potentially all possible ways to configure these electrons. That means I have um, an exponential number of these coefficients I need to keep track of if I want to di directly map the, um, the state of the, the molecule. Now the good news, mixed news so to speak, is that many molecules actually are well described by only a few configurations. And that's why when people use things like density functional theory or Hartree-Fock or like simple cluster methods, you can get really good answers for some problems. The bad news is some um, things such as often catalyst and say high temperature superconductors, they need many of these configurations. And as a result, we have a hard time um, we have an okay time, if experimentalist brings us a good catalyst, we have an okay time using these theory to try to explain how it works. We have a very hard time predicting catalyst. Like I can't go to my computer and like crank through a bunch of catalysts and have, and have a high certainty that that catalyst will work in lab. All right, and so the way I think about this is basically a classical computer requires an exponential number of electrons to store all of those coefficients, to represent only n electrons. A molecule, on the other hand, somehow uses n electrons to represent n electrons, which is clearly just a tautology. But it's kind of an interesting point of the gap between nature and the way we do these computations. So Richard Feynman had this uh, disruptive idea in the 80s, um, which is, why not build the computer out of quantum mechanical pieces? that would break this asymmetry. Um, now, in the 80s, uh, <coughs> classical computers were not so good. So it's hard to imagine building a quantum computer. Uh, but, it, but it was a provocative idea, and no one cared. No one cared. Maybe two or three people cared. <laughs> Everyone else was like, you know, physicists get old. They have crazy ideas. We just forget about it. Uh, but then, in uh, the mid-90s, Peter Shore, who was a mathematician at Bell Laboratories, he showed that if you wanted to, say you had a large number n, which is the product of two primes, and you want to, given n, find one of these primes. And then you get the other one basically for free. Uh, and it turns out that the methods we have to do that are not that different from what you learned in grade school. Like, does it divide by three? No. Does it divide by five? No. Um, but it turns out that if you had a quantum computer, you could actually factor this uh, number quickly. There's a polynomial algorithm, exponentially faster than the best known classical algorithm. And this is important because this one-way function, so if I have p and n, I can get q, right? But if I have n, it's very hard for me to find p and q, is one of the ways that we keep the internet safe through encryption, okay? And so as soon as this happened, Everybody cared. Mostly spies, right? Because <laughs> they want to break codes. Maybe thieves who want to steal your bank account. Uh, and we, but what I like about it is that um, unlike Feynman's idea, which is, which, is a, which is a grand idea of I have a quantum computing device which allows me to simulate other quantum systems, uh, Peter Shore's idea is mathematically very direct. It's like you have these steps, you put these steps together. And what's nice is if you take those steps and you apply them first to a system of electrons and then to electrons within a molecule, you find that you get a linear scaling in the number of quantum bits that you need um, to the spatial basis functions, which are these addresses. And so even with a modestly sized quantum computer of a few thousand quantum bits, you could start doing pretty much exact calculations on molecules which will never be able to be exactly calculated using classical computers. 
And so the way I think about that is, right, again, classical geek computer uses an exponential number of electrons to represent n electrons. Molecules use n to represent n. And a quantum computer basically uses a linear number of electrons to represent those n electrons. All right. So now, how do you build these things? So I just like to remind people that, uh, you know, we did not always have classical computers, <laughs> that we have some choice of bits. So like in 100 BC, we use gears. We actually use gears for the next basically 2,000 years. <laughs> Uh, then in the 1940s, we shifted over to this vacuum tube type technology. In this period where there were functioning large vacuum tube computers, which you could argue won World War II, uh, the, the first transistor was also made. And this first transistor, which you can see an um, example of it at Bell Labs, uh, you know, is about the size of a Coke can. And now we get to, you know, closer to today. This is just a picture of my laptop. So. Um, so quantum bits, we have the same choices. So we have, you can represent it, the physical system into any physical system that will hold quantum information. And these are not all possible examples, these are just some examples. Um, a lot of the early work in quantum computing was done using NMR because due to the utility of NMR for understanding chemicals, it already had sufficient control electronics that you could directly map these quantum algorithms onto this device but it has some quite problems with thermalization. Um, I would say at the moment, the two kind of leading contenders are superconductors and atomic ions. Uh, but if you saw the announcement from Microsoft yesterday about quantum computing, there's hope for these future uh, Majorana kind of pieces. But there's great work in photons, neutral atoms, and quantum dots. So what do we need? So we need something to carry the information, some kind of quantum bit. We need to be able to manipulate that bit, do single qubit gates. We need to be able to do conditional operations. These two qubit gates um, allow us to do logic. We need to be able to measure the outcome of our experiment. And then we need some way to connect many, many qubits. And I would say at the moment, these uh, parts here for superconductors and ions are well understood. And the focus, technologically, is thinking about this problem. How do we start to put together many of these pieces? So the problem is, any quantum system that we can talk to, uh, other things can talk to. And typically, it's something boring, like the air conditioning in your lab goes out. <laughs> Sometimes it can be, you can see the magnetic field of the MARTA moving as your quantum bit gets really good. Uh, and at the end of the day, there are always these quantum effects of vacuum fluctuations, which will always create some errors. So errors, errors are unavoidable. And um, when I think about my quantum information work, I really think about it in the context of always trying to improve reliability. And so these are just different ways you could imagine improving reliability. Uh, at the software and firmware level, thinking about algorithms and architectures that are better, some kind of open loop feedback, closed loop feedback, and then better hardware. Like, can we make hardware that's thermodynamically or kinetically protected from noise? Um, and can we make hardware which is compatible with this closed loop control? So today, I'm going to really briefly just talk about surface electrode ion traps. And then I'm going to explain um, how quantum error correction works, uh, and then talk about a, a recent experiment we, we did in collaboration with the University of Maryland on quantum error detection. All right, so here's this list of criteria. So the qubits are going to be the internal, internal states of ions. This is a picture of single atomic ions trapped in my lab here at Georgia Tech, calcium ions. One qubit gates are done by lasers or microwaves. Two qubit gates are done by lasers, microwaves, or Coulomb repulsion. Measurement is through the fluorescence of the ions. You can see they're quite bright. And currently, scalability, there's kind of two main ideas. The one idea is you basically have a CCD chip of uh, electrodes, which you, yeah, you have a, ch a ch chip with many electrodes, and you shuttle the ions around, like a charge coupled device sort of thing. The other one is you have a small quantum register, which is then entangled with other quantum registered via photon interconnect. Okay. Um, so laser-cooled ions, the basic important thing is that you can scatter many, many, many photons 
And so even though the apparatus is at room temperature, the ions themselves can be um, at a millikelvin down to like five microkelvin. Uh, you just need a, any, we choose ions that are simple to understand because we don't know how to solve every ion. So we, we pick ions that have a single electron in the valence shell. And then off that transition, we can measure this fluorescence. Uh, we've done some work in my lab pushing towards being able to do this with molecular ions. Um, that's a totally different talk. Uh, the ion trap, um, which has been used in all kinds of mass spectroscopy analysis. Many of you probably use an ion trap for some mass spec. Uh, what it does is the ions are held by DC confining potentials ax uh, axially. And then radially, it's held by this flipping and flopping um, oscillating field. And so if the ion can't move fast enough, it can't find its way out of this trap. So in um, motivated by this idea of this uh, scalable CCD type architecture for ions, uh, John Chiavrini at NIST Boulder uh, realized that you could cut, you could imagine cutting this electrode and unfolding the trap onto a plane. And when you do that, you now can build these traps in two dimensions and actually make any layout that you would like. So here's just a movie of that from uh, the folks at GTRI. There, right, it's the four rod trap. These ions are sitting there. You cut that top electrode to plane, you flatten it out, and the ions continue to float above the surface. Here's a movie uh, that I took with Rob Clark sitting there uh, back in 2005, I think, <laughs> of uh, these are just dust particles. So the other beautiful thing about a surface electrode ion trap is you can, Ion traps work for anything. They don't have to work for atoms. So we just trap these polystyrene beads. You see they float through here. We can control which way they go. Um, and, you, and the key thing is they float above the surface, right? But the surface is totally, the, the trap itself is defined by the electrodes in the plane. So in the last 10 years, uh, well, so, so if you're doing the um, charge coupled device architecture, or if you're doing photon interconnects, in both cases, here you definitely need these kind of surface traps. For the photon interconnects, you kind of need it because you want to get your um, bandwidth of photon connections high enough. So you need a place to store ions and shift them around, um, uh, as pointed out in this work. So what's been great in the last 10 years is that uh, there's been tremendous progress in how these junctions have been made. Um, these are, this is a nice picture of a similar cross-junction from uh, here at GTRI, where ions can be shifted across. Uh, we print them, now they're just printed using kind of typical CMOS technology of metals and insulators. Uh, here's an example um, that from my student, True, who used the clean room facilities here, uh, I guess before this building, <laughs> to make a small spherical mirror in these traps by etching here into the silicon layer and then just building the trap on top. And what I loved about this is the rest of the process didn't really change. The only part of the process that needed tweaked up was figuring out how to get a very good smooth surface here. And then here you can see how it works, right? There's a silicon chip and then metals, insul insulator metal layers. This is very, uh, there are many more layers of metal insulation now, but in 2011, this was the state of the art. And what's great is we could take this single atomic ion and we could shuttle it over this mirror. And then here you can see, right, the reflection, this is one atom and the reflection of one atom. And it's an important step towards building a device which has enough scalable points that you can do measurement everywhere. What's great is, I mean, there are many different places making these kind of chips. Here's a chip that we got from Sandia National Laboratories. And this is a image in our laboratory of a single atom moving up the arm of this chip. And we've been able to show that uh, we can move ions through these um, junctions without causing too much heating, which is really critical for then laying out this whole process. Um, so what I like to say is humans, humans are pretty good at making things in 3D, we're really good at making things in 2D. So in two dimensions, we can take these traps and start to add in um, all kinds of different features. We can add in junctions. We can add in places that improve our measurement. 
And then I'm not going to talk about it. We can also add in control electronics to, to directly apply the single and two qubit gates we need. What's great is there's really a global community of people working on these surface traps. Uh, we, for the last 10 years, have actually had a standard so people can make traps anywhere and send the trap in the standard package to anywhere else. Um, it's been quite good. All right, so now I'm going to start to shift gears to error correction. Um, the, so, so remember, the goal is, uh, the goal is we want to try to solve a chemistry problem I can't solve today. Right? I don't want to solve a chemistry problem that I can solve today. So one chemistry problem we can't solve is we don't understand exactly how bacteria which fixate nitrogen to ammonia, we don't exactly understand how um, their enzymes work. So we know that there's this complex here of iron and molybdens and sulfides where the action takes place. But we don't, know what actually, we don't know exactly what happens there. And we can't really simulate this. So the group at Microsoft, um, the quantum architecture group at Microsoft, uh, in collaboration with ETH, uh, tried to see how many gates would it take on a quantum computer to actually just simulate this piece here. And they calculate this number of 10 to the 15 gates, roughly which is a lot of gates, but when you think about how many gates are in your classical computation, it's not crazy. Um, the problem is the best current error rates for doing gates in quantum devices is 10 to the minus 3 on average, average over all gates, say. Uh, so that means we can basically only do 1,000 gates. So how are we going to get from 1,000 gates to 10 to the 15 gates? Um, so, well, first, what can you do with 1,000 gates? So there's just actually very recently this nice nature paper from the superconducting group at IBM where with 1,000 gates, you can get, uh, they're closer to 100 gates, uh, you can get a really good measurement of the ground state of hydrogen, uh, lithium hydride, things already start to go kind of goofy. So these black points are the experiments, and this uh, green fuzz here is the theory of how they expect their experiments to work because they know their experiments have noise, right? So we know, like, uh, I, like the community knows there is noise and knows where it is, but it kind of also shows you that we need to really suppress this noise to get very accurate answers. So this is a very beautiful experiment. It's the first time people have done a quantum chemistry calculation with three atoms on a quantum computer, small quantum computer. Uh, but it also shows, I think, that the, the real necessity of getting these error rates down. So we have kind of two ways to do things. Um, so one is we could imagine, well, let's just get the controls really good. Like, let's just make these, get the lasers perfect, the microwave is perfect. Let's then add control theory on top. And my group um, actually has done a lot of that. So this is a kind of a review article about some of the work we've done on single qubit control. Uh, very recently, my student James Lung, um, there should be a one here, yeah, 1708. Uh, looked at a new way to do two-qubit control, which has indeed worked in the laboratory. Uh, but we're still limited by technical noise. And if we could get rid of the technical noise, so if we get below the technical noise, um, yeah, uh, we expect for ions kind of an error of 10 to the minus 6, which is still, right, we need nine orders of magnitude to get to something with 10 to the 15 gates. So what we really need is some way to reduce the um, error, which I think of as kind of algorithmic reduction of entropy through quantum error correction. All right. So I think of the control situation as sort of uh, in, a, in a quick segue to the Three Little Pigs story. If you're not familiar, uh, we can talk about it later. So ideally, we'd like a qubit that would be like a brick house, right? And then the bad wolf comes in. Bounces off the house, pig is saved, everybody's happy. Now, the problem is we only have these straw qubits. And the wolf comes in, eats the pig. It's not so good for us. So still, straw is much cheaper than bricks. 
So, so this is not what happens in the kid's story, but you can imagine the straw house pig was like, well, I'll just build a bunch of straw houses. And as long as I move from house to house pretty regularly, when the wolf comes in, he'll probably snag a house that I'm not at. If I can repair these houses, right, faster than the wolf is destroying them, and still save money versus making brick houses, it's a much better way to do things. So, uh, so quantum error correction, error correction generically works like that. Uh, so in classical error correction, the simplest example is majority voting. Um, and so you could imagine if I wanted to send a message of one bit, I just send it three times. Um, and I always say this is like talking to my grandmother on the phone, right? Like, <laughs> I'm coming over. Go, oh yeah, what? Anyway, so the problem is, uh, there's two problems. So the first thing is, if I measure the value of these bits, quantum mechanically it'll collapse me to some classical state, which will be bad. Uh, this copying, this, this basically is an example also of copying, right? So when you do make a backup of your computer, that's effectively the simplest error correcting code. You've just copied the data. So in quantum mechanics, we can't copy, and we can't stop to measure the data because then we would lose the advantage of, um, yeah, we basically would lose the advantage of the quantum machine. So instead what we do is we ask a different question, which is we measure the subspace. So here, if you think of this as, again, three neighbors, you could ask these neighbors, like, oh, do you agree with your neighbor? Oh yeah, yeah, I agree, I agree. And when they agree with their neighbors, um, you know there's no error but you actually don't know what the data is. You don't know if it's a zero, or you don't know if it's a one. You just know they agree. Now here, um, this neighbor in the middle disagrees with the neighbors on both sides. And so you can tell that neighbor that they should change their mind without getting any sense of what the neighbor thinks, right? That part's still hidden to you. And that allows you to keep the quantum superposition you need for the speed up without, uh, but still being able to measure the errors. So it's a way you, instead of measuring the data and comparing the data, you just, you set up a way to measure the errors. Now, quantum mechanically, there are two types of errors that you can have, a bit flip and a phase flip. Um, and that basically means we need two classical codes. And we can further concatenate these codes to suppress the error. So that brings us to a key concept, which is the threshold. And so this is an example of concatenated codes uh, in a calculation we did here. But the point is, here is the physical error rate, this red line. And then below some threshold, and this threshold will depend on all kinds of things, um, you can use, you can find a family of codes that can suppress that error um, as low as you'd like it to go, right? So, the plan is we make the physical error as good as we can, and then we use um, the fact that there's a family of codes of different distance to lower that error down to the 10 to the minus 15 we need. Um, and I guess I should point out that actually to break people's bank accounts, you only need about 10 to the 12 gates. So you could just focus on that if you want. Um, all right, so in the early 90s, um, people took classical error correcting codes they made quantum error correcting codes. Um, and then the problem was when they tried to figure out how good the gates had to be to meet this threshold, they had to be good to say a part per million to about 100 part per million. And it was, uh, uh, I'm an optimist, so that seems possible to me, but it's like, it's kind of at the edge, right? If this was like a part per trillion, then maybe we'd say, okay, forget it. Like we, these codes aren't gonna help. Now, people thought, well, you know, there are other ways to protect information, not just through codes. Like, so if you think about a magnetic hard drive or like a cassette tape, uh, it's, it's controlled by actually the physical interaction of a magnet. And so people said, well, can we make a quantum hard drive? Can we make a system whose physical interaction preserves that information? And the bad news, well, the, the, the good news was yes, the bad news was it required basically the system to be four-dimensional. If it wasn't four-dimensional, there would be some error that would act like a string 
um, which would ruin uh, your memory in the same way that if you have only a one-dimensional magnet, it's also not thermodynamically stable, right? You need higher dimensions. But what's incredible is this idea could be coupled with some ideas about quantum error correction. I mean, it, it was a, started as a quantum error correction idea, moved to this hard drive idea, moved back to an error correction idea, where Rosendorfer and Harrington showed in 2006 that you basically s use your quantum computer to simulate a 2D version of this hard drive, but with feedback, where you're watching and fixing things. And what they found is that you could then do quantum computation to arbitrary precision if the underlying gates were only good to 1%. And that, I think, is when companies, uh, et cetera, started to really pay attention. Because I don't really need my qubits to be that good. My qubits are already better than this. So um, this actually, earlier this month, I organized a, a workshop on quantum error correction, quantum error correction, fourth international conference on quantum error correction at the University of Maryland, co-organized with Jake Taylor. Uh, and we were sponsored by you know, the University of Maryland and NIST through the, the, these joint centers for institute, sponsored by Georgia Tech through this nice uh, Center for Research and Novel Computing Hierarchies, sponsored by the government, um, Laboratory for Telecommunication Sciences, sponsored by Microsoft, right, Northrop Grumman, and then these two companies, Rigetti and INQ, which are startup quantum computing companies. So right now, there is a ton of jobs for people who know about quantum computers, how to build them, quantum error correction. Um, and I think if you, yeah, I, wait, if you're interested in changing directions, think about changing the structure. Uh, yeah, but what I want to point out, actually, just to come back, is that this, we all think that we need this quantum error correction to make these computers actually do something useful. All right, so back to hardware. So ions, if you have, say, seven ions, you could imagine implementing um, one of the smallest quantum error correcting codes, one of those error correcting codes that was devised in the, in the early 90s. And this, the, at least the basic operations of encoding the state were done in 2014 um, in Reiner Blatt's group in Innsbruck. Um, but what's neat about a chain of ions is that even though the ions are in a linear chain, the connection between the ions, because it's through the normal modes of motion, uh, it's basically a fully connected graph. So if I want to change quantum error correcting code, I just basically change the firmware, uh, but not the hardware, up to, up to some, some size. Um, and so now, uh, so this, this has been a big, uh, current big direction of what we've been doing in the group. Um, I'm only going to talk about this quantum error detection uh, code and experiment we did with the University of Maryland. Uh, but we re recently had this nice paper showing how if you take into account physical errors, you can make better codes by my student Yuan Li. And then we have a paper which should be out soon on the archive uh, talking about how to implement the surface code, which is the code which has this 1% error uh, threshold, the smallest instance, which doesn't have that good of a pseudo threshold, uh, using ion traps, which is kind of our, um, I would say, three year plan. All right. So if you think about um, so if you th think back about this, uh, the 3-bit code, if I think about, um, I'm, if I ask a question about agreement between neighbors, I don't care if they're plus or minus, right? I just care that they agree. And that's the Z guy. So a Z asks one guy, are you plus or minus? And two Zs basically say, are you both plus or are you both minus? And if you're not, there's a switch. So these check operators look for the parity of bits, of these four bits. And this check operator looks for the phase parity of those four bits, which is hard to explain, but it's the quantum, kind of the quantum analog of that bit flip. And so then there are these four logical operators corresponding to uh, measuring in the classical computer basis or measuring in, the, um, in this rotated kind of quantum basis. 
And this four qubit, four qubit checks are the basis of many ways to build quantum error correcting codes. So let's say I want to prepare the logical zero state. What I can do is I can start with all of my bits just in a zero state, and then I apply the sequence of operations. Um, but there can be errors. And these errors will also be propagated through these two qubit things, leading to possible two qubit errors. So, um, so here, if we forget about the errors, the state that I get here is either all of the states are in zero, or all the states are in one. And this is sometimes referred to as a Schrodinger cat state. It's like the cat is alive, or the cat is dead. And if I measure any bit of information, I completely collapse to everybody's dead or everybody's alive. Now this two-bit error, what it will do is it will flip these last two bits. And if I think of my logical qubit space, what I see is the second logical qubit is flipped. But the first logical qubit has been preserved. So it turns out that for this code, if there are errors in the gates, if there are errors in the gates, right? It's not a channel. Uh, yeah, if there are errors in the gates, then I can only preserve one of these qubits. And so what I do is I build my check operators in a way where that single qubit's preserved, and all of the errors accumulate kind of on the other qubit. So yes, yeah, so that single qubit error here can lead to a two qubit error here, which is equivalent to a logical error on that second uh, logical qubit. Um, and so this organization of these, uh, sorry, the organization of how these circuits look is, is, is actually related to work my student Yu Tamita did when she was an intern at Microsoft. Um, and there's been a similar work on these stabilizers uh, from the IBM superconducting group. And then what I'm going to talk to you now with our experiments um, is on the archive and should be published in Science Advances later this month. So what's the hardware look like at the University of Maryland, who you're collaborating with? What you have is you have a big laser that comes through. There's a multi-channel AOM, which allows you to then interact with individual ions. And then there's a multi-channel PMT, which then allows you to measure the states of these guys. Uh, here they have kind of 1% fidelity on the measurement. Um, when you measure over all of these different states, what you find is that you don't quite get, um, you don't just get the product of these single qubit measurements. And the reason is, is there's classical crosstalk in that photon counter. And so if the, if, if the one channel goes off, there's a higher probability that one of its neighboring channels can go off. Um, so what's nice is that secondary error that would occur uh, happens in a way where our distance to code can still suppress that underlying detection error. So when we do this, we prepare the state zero to logical zero. And this is all of the states written, like right, the binary state is now transformed into just a number. Um, we should only get basically population in zero and in 30. We see there's some error. The fidelity is quite good. And if we look at these two qubits, so the one qubit which we've built in this way, which is fault tolerant, we see that 98% of the time uh, it's correct, uh, almost 100% of the time. Um, but the 0.3% of the time, it goes bad. Whereas the qubit, which is we've made it kind of sacrificial, you see that it fails much higher, right? It fails closer to the 2%, right? And this is really, um, so we, we also do this by, by doing, adding a check, and you see basically the same plots, that the qubit, the sacrificial qubit fails at 2%, which is kind of the error rate of the gates, and the good qubit fails at a rate of 0.5% or so. Um, now, it's only an error detection code. So that means we don't have enough information to correct. We only have enough information to throw out the runs we know are bad, right? We don't, right? We still keep runs that are bad, 
but we throw out the ones where we've been heralded to know that they in fact have gone incorrectly. And that means there is some loss in kind of data rate because we end up throwing the ones that are bad, but the ones that get through, uh, we know in fact are good. Um, so here is the physical error rate of the physical qubits. This yellow curve is the error rate of the qubit, uh, which is fault tolerant, which we've set up so that no single gate error will destroy it. And here is the error curve for the sort of more sacrificial qubit. And uh, <laughs> this plot uh, is really good news and because some sense it's boring. It more or less matches like our theoretical guess of what should happen. But in terms of building an error corrected circuit, that's incredibly good news. Because the thing that the um, quantum error correction theorists are most worried about is that there's some unknown correlated errors that we aren't accounting for. And at least in this small system, there are no surprise unknown errors. Which means there's no, there still remains no in principle reason why we can't make these logical qubits large enough to make the error sufficiently small. Um, let me just check the time. How many? Five ten minutes. Five ten minutes, okay. So I just briefly, there's some cost, right? So if I have, um, uh, so, so for every error correcting code, um, there's some limit on the number of steps that I can take, right? And some, this is basically number of gates. So number of gates is the number of qubits times the number of computational steps. And as I increase my error correcting code, I can get to the point where the algorithm that I want to do will succeed, right? So if I have no error correction, not much works. As I increase the error correction, I get to the point where it succeeds. <coughs> So one of um, my first papers here uh, at Georgia Tech was the question of what if, the, what if the NSA has already built a factoring quantum computer? And then they get tired of, of factoring everything and they give it to you to do science. Like what kind of science can you do? And so this curve here corresponds to one level of error correction, two levels of error correction, three levels of error correction, four levels of error correction. And these Diagonals here tell you how much error correction you need to succeed at what you're doing. Um, and the first thing is, it depends a lot on how you do the algorithm. So this is the, bright, the, the, the way to do Shor's algorithm that takes more qubits and less steps. Of course, you could use less qubits and more steps, but it turns out the amount of error correction you need becomes really tough. So what we did is we just looked at a simple um, magnet model. And what's nice is that the, you can see the linear, um, that, 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 that the cost only grows linearly like you hope, but the amount of time steps seem quite long when you do the error correction. And so we spent a lot of time uh, with other people in the field, uh, particularly Fred Chong at the University of Chicago and Margaret Montnozzi at uh, Princeton, uh, thinking about how can we actually calculate what's the real cost of doing these things. And in that process, not only our team, but many, many teams around the world at Microsoft and elsewhere, realized that all of these numbers are just, um, you know, we haven't had the years of optimizing that we've had for classical algorithms. So better compilation shifted all of this to the, yeah, all this to the left by a factor of 1,000 with no change in the number of qubits. And better subroutines have ended up costing a little more qubits but basically shifted to another factor of 100. And we don't think that we're near that limit yet. And so I actually think there's a lot of opportunity in, for a long time the field had people working on quantum algorithms, people working on devices, and there was so much um, space in between that there was very little information flow and many missing abstractions. And we're moving into an area now where there is good reason to work on things like technologically aware error correction, better ways to do these optimizations. And as I mentioned before, there is like a, it's a growing industrial effort. Uh, Microsoft working on Majorana qubits, Google and IBM uh, working on superconductors, and Rigetti working on superconductors, Intel working on 
uh, I guess, superconductors and semiconductors, ion Q working on ions. Um, I think, uh, I hope that I've convinced you that it's kind of an exciting time to do quantum computing, that, the, that we're reaching the point where quantum error correction is really right on the horizon. And once that errors of these quantum bits drop sufficiently low, I think it will revolutionize the way that we calculate the properties of materials and chemistry. And with that, I'd like to uh, just thank the sponsors, uh, National Science Foundation, Army Research Office, um, IARPA, uh, the Humboldt Foundation for a Humboldt Fellowship. This is the group, and we do other stuff. We work a lot on cold molecular ions, and we have some new project on sorting cells using surface electrode ion traps. Um, that's it. Thanks for your attention. Well, um, so I'll tell you the one optimist thing, and then I'll switch to the other side. So the one optimist thing is that right now, we don't have a device. And so when people calculate how many gates you need and how many qubits you need, uh, we actually, the, whatever the, the field, the character of the field is to be pessimistic. So you like, people try to prove rigorous bounds. They say, there's a rigorous bound between these two operators, right? Um, if you think about how we actually do calculations of molecules on a classical computer, we all know DFT will fail sometime. We all know, we all use DFT all the time. And then when it fails, we don't get upset. We're just like, okay, I guess I moved to the next program. And so the optimist in me thinks once we have working hardware, all those numbers will come down, right? So, um, in that Microsoft paper for nitrogenase, you need on the order of 2,000 logical qubits, which means good, and you need about 10 to the 15 gates. So you need basically 2,000 logical qubits that fail at a rate of 10 to the minus 15. Now, if in ion traps we could hit 10 to the minus 6 physical qubits, then I would only need um, uh, I basically need 350, um, 350 physical qubits to logical qubit, which would be a great deal. Uh, the, Microsoft is working on these Majorana qubits, which don't exist yet, <laughs> but they think if they did exist, they would have an error of 10 to the minus 8. And so they'd be able to do this transformation at about a factor of, um, yeah, you know, basically 7. They need 7 logical qubits to physical qubits. Uh, however, if we're stuck at errors that are close to only 10 to the minus 3, then we're going to need um, thousands of logical qubit, thousands of physical qubit for logical qubit. And that's, that's the question, right? So um, we're still, yeah. I, I would say they're one, that we're one to two years away from 100 like machines that can really use 100 physical qubits. Um, I really think the challenge in the field, from my perspective, is really scalability. Like, how do I then take those 100 qubits, put them into blocks, and make 1,000 qubits? Um, and whether that turns out to be, like, you know, that's, uh, you know, coming from like a scientist background, we always think of that as like, oh, Someone else will scale stuff up later, it's fine. But of course, that's a really hard problem. Um, and I'll take some more. So, I, I've heard talks on you know, quantum computing a couple of times, and I, I, I don't pretend that I understand all of it, certainly. Uh, but I always learned something, and I, I need to ask a really basic question, and maybe I missed it. What is the, what is the physical manifestation of the state what are, you, are you looking at it? What is the on and off? Yeah, so, um, so we use two ions, uh, calcium ion and ytterbium ion. Uh, 
So in calcium ion, um, on is the electron in the s orbital, basically the ground state of calcium. And off is where you've shelved the electron into this d orbital. Um, so it's an optical qubit. Um, for ytterbium, on and off uh, is basically the nucleus of ytterbium. And so we off, so it's a hyperfine state, but off is the lower hyperfine state, and on is the upper hyperfine state. So for the calcium, it would be fluorescence or no fluorescence? Yeah, and it's the same for ytterbium. So, so for, for, for atomic ions, we always detect by fluorescence. Uh, but what we use is the on and off states different. Yeah. Yeah. And so the nice thing, I mean, so the nice thing about, say, ytterbium ions is hyperfine states don't decay in a, in a time scale which is relevant to us. Uh, the the hyperfine states of ytterbium also have a clock state, which means they're relatively insensitive to magnetic field fluctuations. So with, with um, yeah, actually with not that much work, you can get a um, kind of cue, say, like the oscillations you can do relative to the decay of it, of, of, uh, yeah, of a million without much work. And you can do better um, by adding magnetic shielding and all this kind of stuff. There's nothing further. We'll thank Ken one more time and wish him luck at different.